to climb a tree. Watch out. Ah! Hi there. Welcome to another episode of the Board Game Business Podcast. I'm your host, Richard Noon. I'm here, as always, with Jeremy Commander and Brian Hink. Today we're going to have a mailbag episode. So we have some questions from some of our fans, and we'll try and answer them the best we can. So, let's see. Letter number one. When do you give up on a game? I mean, the biggest thing is when it's not fun. Right. Uh, and you don't see a way for it. So I guess when you think the game is done, you can't find any other ways to improve it, but it's still not a fun or unique experience. Mm-hmm. I, I, I like that. That's a good way to put it. Because there are games like that. Like, this is done. We're, we're done. But, like, I, there's nothing I can add to this that isn't going to completely change the game and make it a new one. Mm-hmm. It's a new um, game, yeah. Yeah, and, and that I just, like... Do you feel like that's when you copy a mechanic that you've seen... And it's mm. just sort of like, you've talked about, like, when your uh, designer knows... Mistakes um, you make mistakes as a designer. Mistakes yeah, you make, yeah. that's the one. Mm-hmm. And number one for you was, don't make an Apple's Apple's clone. That you was know? number ten. That oh, was the oh, last okay, one. Okay, so we switched yeah, to yeah, it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> uh, but, but that was on the list. And yeah. the idea, you know, like, I think a lot of people sort of, uh, even beginner... Well, specifically beginner designers, they mm-hmm. see a game that they like, and they make... A version of that, mm-hmm. and they're you know they're like so I really enjoy playing Dominion, so I'm going to make a bunch of cards that do a bu- bunch of different things, and yeah. I'm going to have you know you start with these cards and you buy other things and you build your deck you know like really nothing different there, and mm-hmm. is that sort of what you're talking about like the the experience is nothing unique and new and different yeah and, and special. it could be definitely could be yeah I mean because um, I've played plenty of games before that like I couldn't even tell you after playing it that there's anything wrong with it. Mm-hmm. You know, that it's really, like, it works, there's a no runaway leader, you know, it's a... It's just mediocre. Until the end. But it's like, yeah, it's not, like, amazing. It's not, not a new, like, fun thing that I want to keep doing over and over again. Like, it just, it, it doesn't quite uh, amaze me. To compare that in, like, the movie space, how many movies do you see that are forgettable? Oh, yeah. yeah. And years later, you see them on TV, and like, did I? Yeah, I think I saw this one. Yeah. And it's just forgettable, because it wasn't, it wasn't like a bad movie. You weren't like, oh, this is awful. It just wasn't very good. It was just forgettable. Like, nah. and so it's you can just use... another, you know, basic action movie. Yeah, yeah, I've seen that before. And it didn't add anything interesting or have any interesting elements mm-hmm. that you remember, any memorable moments. It yeah. uh, didn't make you experience anything emotionally that, that stuck in your head. Because, mm-hmm. you know, emotions create memories. Mm-hmm. Uh, and so you could have a game that's not a bad game, but it's kind of flat. Mm-hmm. It just doesn't have that emotional experience, mm-hmm. uh, even though it's mechanically sound or complete. Mm-hmm. And then that's a game you might give up on and put on the shelf. I, 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 this is also why I talk about like my number one tip is like work on more than one game at the same time. You know, yeah. do more than one game because mm-hmm. if your your passion game, your baby, that you're like, oh, I'm gonna make this game, turns out to be that that mediocre game. It's not bad. It's just not that emotionally memorable. And and that's not. Yeah. It, it shouldn't be published. It yeah. needs to go on the shelf. But if yeah. you have more than one, like, hey, this one is really taken off or resonating with people. Insider Trading, which I think you both have played, mm-hmm. and that one, uh, it tested very well with playtesters. A lot of playtesters love that game. And they ask to play it again, and they really enjoy it, and it has some explosive emotional moments, but it's not marketable. And so it goes on the shelf for the same reason. If you're a game designer and you watch the Shark Take TV show, all the entrepreneurs that are on there to pitch their ideas or their products, that's one of the things they get hammered with is, how is this going to be marketed? How is this going to be sold? Even if I have a great, I have the better mousetrap. The question that's asked is often, how are you going to compete with yeah, the big so boys? And so. Yeah, yeah. So as a game designer, you're doing the same thing. You're trying to compete with the publishers, designers who already are, you know, possibly more established than you. Um, but they already have games that are marketed that, that people, this is a great worker placement game. You know, this is a good deck building game that are out there successful. Yep. Why is yours better? Or is it better, but are, is there anything you can grab onto that, that says why it's unique or why it's better? Is there right. a unique thing, a unique draw? What does quitting mean? Because you've talked about putting it on yeah. the shelf. Do you ever completely throw something away? You, I, can, I can ask that, or yeah. I can answer that. So okay. when you say, so putting it on the shelf is a really good way to think about it. Because if it's your first game or if it's a game you're really emotionally attached to, mm-hmm. it's going to be really hard to give up on it. Yeah, yeah. And it's going to be hard for you to just to, to do that. But if you just say, I'm going to set it over here, I'm going to put it on the shelf, I'll come back to it later. You can always come back to it. You probably won't, but you might. You've come back to games before. I have. I have. Uh, Booze Barons. 
went on the shelf for a year until I had uh, it, it got some ideas about how to improve the movement system and things like that, and then it, it came back. How many you hear about these movies that were like stuck in development or sitting on a shelf somewhere for years, and they finally come out? And sometimes they're kind of like, eh, I can see why it's sat on the shelf for years. And sometimes they're like, oh wow, this this is really good. And just the timing wasn't right. You know, there wasn't the right people involved in the project or whatever. The, the right, right idea. A political issue that happened at political the time. Political issue, yeah. And, yeah. and then it wasn't the right time to get it out there. Mm-hmm. Sometimes it's a matter of um, getting the right person with the right passion on board. Yes. To uh, to get it through over the finish line. To take it to the next level. And so, so, so in your game designs, we do the same way. That you may put it on the shelf and come back to it when you have more experience as a designer. Or some new mechanic you haven't seen before comes out, like, oh, that would be perfect mm-hmm. for this game. And it might fix it and get it off the shelf. Uh, and you can, you know, you can take that game off the shelf and give it another shot. Hey, Richard, what else is in the mailbag? <laughs> well, <laughs> let's get to letter number two. We got a question from a listener named Niles. Uh, how do you recover from mistakes and setbacks? Woo! That's a good one. That is a great question. So, who would like to begin on this one? Um, I can. not Everybody's looking at me. <laughs> I, I'll, I'll go first. I'll, I'll go first for this one. I'll, 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 I'll go first for this one. So, there, you make lots of mistakes and you have lots of setbacks. And I, I would say, like, the first time I went to publisher speed dating, I made a ton of mistakes. Uh, I, you know, would compare my game to other games, and not all publishers like that. Some do, but a lot of them don't like that. Uh, and I would talk about, you know, the playtesting feedback, how much playtesters liked it, and publishers don't, don't care about that. When they play the game, they're going to make the decision for yourself. They want to know what makes this game unique and special, uh, and how is it going to be marketing. Uh, and so I made tons of mistakes that first time out, but it was a valuable learning experience for me. And only through kind of, uh, I had a buddy, buddy observe me and then give me feedback afterwards. Only through that, that process... Of, of kind of learning that and then talking to publishers later was able to improve how well I do at publisher speed dating for the f- for later times. But if I hadn't done the first time, I would not have had the experience. I would not have been able to to make those mistakes and then learn from them. And I think as a designer, you're going to make a lot of mistakes, and it's got to be okay with that. That you're going to make mistakes and can learn from them and try to do different things. I think Brian's. I love hearing about Brian's mistakes. Uh, it, only because Brian's mistakes at the publisher end, they all wind up costing him money. Mm-hmm. There are like costly mistakes. Uh, you and what said you, could you do that. just. We talked before the podcast. You just learned another uh, big lesson. That's true. <laughs> do you want to tell that story? <laughs> sure. So um, we're for our, our latest Kickstarter campaign that we fulfilled. This is Good Cop, Bad Cop, Undercover. Mm-hmm. Um, there's a there's a way. I, so there's so much that goes into like fulfilling a campaign, but. The this fulfillment service that, that we used for this one, you can upload with a template uh, all the games that need to be shipped, uh, and then they will they will ship them on this automated process. It's great. So um, the the template, the way I read it was, if you have uh, five games that are going to go out to someone, um, you know they wanted good cop, bad cop, bombers and traders, undercover. Um, each of the two promo packs that they got uh, through the campaign as an exclusive. Um, those are five items that need to go in the one package. So, um, but in the Kickstarter line item, it's just one. So we need to multiply that. We need five rows for them. They need to know it's five items in their template. You upload it. You put the declared value in the top line of how much the entire shipment is going to cost. But you can fill in the rest of the rows too, not just the top line. You can fill in all of them. They say right on there, that's fine. So I just you know, copied and pasted each row, including the declared value for the total shipment. And so it thought that every single line item, every single thing, even a little tiny promo pack, was the full, like, $51 reward level, because that's what the whole price is. So now the declared value they put on there was $255. So now the people who have to pay VAT and customs fees on that amount have to pay way more than they should. So we were reimbursing those people, talking to the fulfillment company, seeing if we can get um, reimbursed from them. But it's going to cost us a lot of money, and it's an unhappy. The worst experience you can possibly have as a backer receiving our game, you have to pay possibly even more than the whole reward level cost just to get it from the. the you bought fifty-one dollars of the games, order. and now you're paying more than fifty-one dollars yeah. in taxes. And now you're paying a hundred dollars <laughs> to get your game. Yeah. So it's a terrible experience. It hurts our brand and it hurts our pocketbook because we're going to have to reimburse everybody. So that is one mistake. But and I guess 
for me, when I make a mistake, and I think it's important for other people, is that it's not. It's it's um, a lot of it's just kind of a mental recovery. It is. It is. Yeah. And that you just need to accept it because you can't go back. Correct. Do as much as you can to make up for it, but. You know, just don't worry about it. It's not worth spending time worrying about mistakes you've made. Learn from them, but then just move on and try to fix them and do the the best you can. But um, I know I've spent a lot of time just kind of agonizing over things that I've done wrong in the past, and it doesn't help. You know, it doesn't. It just makes look, you feel bad. Yeah, just look to the future um, and and don't worry about mistakes you made. That that's I guess the advice that I would give. You made it, you made that mistake, and you may need to reset your head. Yeah. You know, if it's it's alive in the moment. You know, take a walk. Go outside, yep. get some sunlight on yep. your face and your skin, yeah. and you know, just walk around for a minute so you're, you're using your body and your sunlight and just get a little mental reset. Yep. Uh, you get through those five stages of grief. You know, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> get, quickly, yeah, yeah. 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 You gotta chalk so it up it's going to take time regardless, just yeah. to, you know, before you're able to sort of function yeah. at top efficiency again. And uh, I appreciate the transparency. So I was aware of this mistake that, uh, that Brian made because he put it out in his Kickstarter update. And he was transparent about it. Some of you got hit with his VAC tax because the, the, the value of the game was declared incorrectly, and we apologize for that, and we're working to reimburse you. And so now, you know, if I was on the receiving end of that, I've been receiving on the, many of those mistakes in Kickstarter many, many times. Mm-hmm. If they are transparent with me and upfront and communicative, then I forgive that mistake. People make mistakes. But if they make a mistake and then they bury it, right? They don't, they don't talk about it. They don't admit it to the last possible minute. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then that's that's harder to deal with. It's like, you know, the, the phrase, the scandal, uh, the cover-up is worse than the scandal. Mm-hmm. And, you know, being transparent about that mistake is, is a good way to recover from it. In the, the Star Trek uh, design, we have a list of notes that we sort of, as a group of designers, have written to ourselves and to each other. Don't ever do this again. Don't, you know, <laughs> these words are pretty much forbidden from put, appearing on a card again. You know, like, it, yeah. they always lead to bad situations. We end up having to issue a rata. Like, the, bad things happen. And it's just, like, certain gameplay, it's like, it it never ends up well. So, you know, it's, it's, don't do this. It's your lessons learned. Yes. You know, and that's what uh, Clayton and I will try to do that after each uh, Kickstarter campaign. Yeah, that's well, great. Once we're done, we just kind of do it, you know, for ourselves, just to look back a little bit. What could we have done differently? that would have made this campaign more successful. One thing about a, a Kickstarter creator, too, uh, the hardest, one of the hardest things is that your mistakes are so public. Yes. You know, because everything you do that's, on that's the record. wrong, it's going to affect hundreds of people. Yes. People are going to talk about it. They're going to put it in the comments. Yep. Uh, they're going to put it on BGG. It's going to be everywhere. So it's it's Tied hard. to your brand. It is hard, yeah, hard to make mistakes in such a public fashion. But you, you have to do that. You have to be willing to do that if you're going to be a creator. I would also probably suggest then own them. You know, yeah. don't deny them. Yeah. I want to tie this mistake to our, our previous mailbag question about when to give up on a game. Mm-hmm. I see a lot of Kickstarter games that, like Brian was saying, they're just not that special of a game. They're not that unique or interesting. Mm-hmm. They're kind of that mediocre game. Mm-hmm. Like, oh, I just, it's done, though. It's mechanically. It works. It's good. Mm-hmm. I, I just want to put it on Kickstarter and get it out there and, you know, build my game company. I would say that might be a mistake because if you put out a mediocre game and that's what people back and buy and they, they get this game like, yeah, yeah that game, eh. Mm-hmm. then that affects your brand reputation. And then, then the next Kickstarter you do, the next thing you do, people are going to be like, I don't know, that last one wasn't very good. Mm-hmm. I don't know if I really want to commit to this one. So really, yeah, that first game, it's got to be good. Otherwise, that is another mistake. I, it, don't put it on Kickstarter just because it's done. What else What else you got in the email? Oh, I have one more question. <laughs> question is, do you? how do you distinguish yourself from other games? You've made a wide plethora of games. Yeah, yeah. You've made games of several different types. So, you know, how do you distinguish yourself from the other games of those types? I'm, I'm going to give you. I'm going to give you three things to make your game stand out. So that the first one is this one I learned from uh, Kevin Nunn, who, if you go look at his BGG credits, has made lots of games, all kinds of genres. Uh, he runs Protospill Houston, which I've gone to several times, and I consider him a mentor of mine. He's given me tons of good advice. Uh, in game, both game design and running uh, Protospiel. He's a teacher by his first day job, and so I respect him very much. So Kevin, one of Kevin's things is, is don't design games for what's hot or popular right now. You've got to think about what is going to be the next thing, what's going to be popular or interesting uh, two, three years from now, because a lot of publishers' pipeline is that far out. If they pick up your game now, it may sit in their pipeline for two, three, maybe even more years before it gets out. So, what's like the number one game on BGG right now? Pandemic Legacy. Pandemic Legacy. Uh-huh. Every, because it's number one, 
everybody and their brother is working on a legacy game. I would tell you as a designer, you should not do a legacy game. <laughs> now is the worst time to do a legacy game. If you have a legacy game that's done and it's ready to go, and like it's really final final, now might be a good time to pitch to a publisher. Legacy is hot. If they can get to the market right away, yep. they can capitalize that. Yep. But if you are starting a legacy game, then you're not going to be done till in the future. By the time you get it to the publisher to the market, now the market is saturated with le legacy games. There's tons of them, and that is old news. And you saw this with deck builders. Like, the video right, came right. out, blew up, and there's 8 billion deck builders all over the place. And then that, that saturated the market, and it kind of, eh, interest in deck builders went down. And now you see some deck builders like, well, this is deck building Ooh, with, with a twist. Yeah, there's some, there's some <laughs> yeah. new dynamic to it. You're like, oh, that's an interesting way of doing that. That's different. Uh, and so, so I... I someone, in, someone in the future is going to be watching this, and they'll be like, yeah, like a year later, like, oh, Jeremy was right. <laughs> <laughs> this, this came out a year ago. He was right. All I get is legacy everywhere. So I talked about this with my design partner, and we're like, well, what is the, the, the next thing? What's going to be the interesting thing we're going to see in the future? And we, we, we picked out a couple of them, uh, and one of them we were too slow for. One of them is this, this co-op style card game, game, and I'm just too slow in getting it done. Uh, another one is a 3D chipboard. The novelty of a game that you build on a 3D chipboard, I think we think, oh, that's going to be a, a big trend in the future. I think that's cool. It's a different experience. And now I see on Kickstarter uh, and at BGG, at the con places, these 3D chipboard games blowing up. Mm -hmm. People are like, oh, this is so cool. You like you build a spaceship and your meeples walk around on it and go to different yeah. places. Yeah. And I, I might be too late to the party on that one, too. But that, that idea of that 3D chipboard is being an emerging trend, something that's going to happen in the future. Uh, that I might design for, to, to, if I have that ready, when, as just that's starting to take off, that's appealing for publishers to put in their pipeline. So we did a, we did a 3D game, uh, and we started that, and it was kind of a moonshot idea. What's the wackiest idea that you've never seen before? And it, it got picked up. So then, because, so like, oh, this is very different. This is very unique. I want to do this game. Uh, the second thing is, what's the hook? What's the twist? And so this is, again, a lesson from Kevin Lund and from other designers. You know, what, what's... What makes this different? So I'm going to give you, like, for, for Booze Barons, what were kind of the hooks for Booze Barons? So there's a couple of hook books. So you've played social deduction games before, and your hidden identity, and there's lots of those games in that genre. But most of them don't have, almost, almost don't have three teams. So immediately, that, that's one hook. So this right. game always has three teams. You no matter have the, the big team and, like, a couple of yeah, infiltrator Traders, are, yeah. or you have two fairly evenly matched teams. This is three teams competing, and this makes a whole different political dynamic at the table. Uh, and so that's one one hook for there. And the other hook that I like to pitch for that one is that all the clues about everybody's identity happen when it's not your turn. So the game heavily rewards you for paying attention. If you play on your phone and it's not your turn, you will lose. Mm -hmm. You'll be wiped out. And so you really want to pay attention to what everybody else is doing. And so you're engaged the whole time. The game flies by because it feels like there's no downtime because right. people have to give you information to score points. Uh, and that's maybe the number one criticism of Booze Baron now that it's come out in the reviews and that the game is too fast where it feels like it flies by mm -hmm. too quickly. I was, I was hoping there would be longer. I'm like, all right, that's a fair criticism. Let's play it again. <laughs> <laughs> That's what we expect from, you know, from all of, from all of our games, though. You know, we do want like to pack in a big experience in a short amount of time, and then play it again if you want to play it. Yeah, again. Yeah. You really had fun. I, now, I prefer that style of game. So, Code Names, big hit of last year. What's the hook? What's the twist in Code Names? What, what would you say is the hook or the twist in that game? What makes it stand out? It's a word the, game. Lots of word games. What's the hook? What's it's the so twist? approachable. It's so yeah. easy. so approachable. So approachable, simple. easy. Yeah, lots of games are approachable, easy. Um. The, the, I don't know the 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 dark one. I forget what you the, the assassin. assassin. Yeah. Right on. I would say that's the uh, hook. The assassin. Huh. You kind of explain the game, and the twist is one of these is the assassin. And mm -hmm. if you touch it, you instantly lose. Mm -hmm. And that's an interesting twist. That hmm. that creates some of the most memorable moments in that game when someone does touch the assassin. You're like, oh. Or just the tension when people are like almost going to touch it. Well, it could be that one. Should we go for that one? Yeah. To me, I think it's it's more of a combination of uh, of having allowing people to come and go in the same game and having that be okay, yeah. and then having That's it be yeah. so simple, um, but make people. Uh, think in a, in a way they never have before to try to connect these right. different words together with one word that anybody can do it who speaks that language. And the third thing is we talked a little bit more in the early mail. How can it be marketed? How can it be sold? It's more than just a good game. 
you know, how can it be marketed and how can it be stolen? And so here, doing some homework on the publishers you're pitching to pays off big time. So like, I know Brian has done vanity rewards for multiple of his campaigns where people could pay money to get artwork of themselves that goes in the game. So if my prototype can do that, I may include that in my pitch to Brian. Like, oh, and it has 20 characters that you can sell as vanity rewards as a Kickstarter reward level. And so Brian's like, oh, this is an interesting game, and I already know how I can, I can fund the Kickstarter and a marketing hook for that. One, one thing I'll add to it um, is that to design more for the theme um, rather than mechanics, uh, theme slash experience. Um, if you're, if this is, if you identify this as a problem, that I made this game, um, I, or I tend to make games that already kind of exist, that aren't unique enough, then I would recommend trying to start more from the theme. Don't worry about the mechanics that you're going to pull in, because you're probably going to pull in those mechanics from games you've already played. Mm -hmm. And then you're just going to have a game uh, that people have already played before. Two different things don't add up to a new thing. Yeah. Is what you're saying. Yeah. Well, my bag is empty at this point. We only have the three letters this time. We'd love to hear more questions that people would love to hear answers to, or at least our answers to. Mm -hmm. um, thank you guys for joining me today. I've been your host, Richard New. This is uh, Brian Hink and Jeremy Commander, and I'll see you guys across the table someday. Hey, this is Richard to remind you that you can check out our website at boardgame.business. Old episodes are indexed by subject to make finding an answer to your question easier. You can find links to our BGG Guild, other networking sites, and, if you feel like supporting us, our Patreon account. Donations are used for equipment to improve the presentation of our podcast. Thanks for watching or listening. Thanks so much for watching the Dice Tower videos. Find more great videos and reviews as well as our top-rated audio podcast at Dicetower.com. You can also find other great shows at Dicetowernetwork.com. I'm Eric Summerer, and you've been watching The Dice Tower. The Dice Tower is sponsored by Cool Stuff, Inc., where you can find great games for great prices. Cool Stuff, in stock. Check them out at CoolStuffInc.com.